your screen at the bottom. Okay, my name is Giovanna Fiorino Yanache, and I'm the adult programming and outreach librarian here at the Harrison Public Library. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker tonight, Dr. Kevin Chen, who is currently Chief Economist of Horizon Financial and Adjunct Associate Professor at New York University since November of 2012. He has spoken at Harvard University, Fordham University, Pace University, and the IESE Business School. A member of the Adjunct Advisory Committee of SPS New York University, he is also interim head of the private sector concentration program of of Ms. of Global Affairs at NYU and a member of the Economic Club of New York, fellow of the Foreign Policy Association, Editorial Advisory Board member of the Global Commodity Applied Research Digest at JP Morgan Center for Commodities at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. Professor Chen received a PhD in finance from the Financial Asset Management Engineering Center at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland in October of 2004, a master's degree in finance from the Center for Economic Research at the Tilburg University in the Netherlands in August 2001, and a BA degree in economics from the Renmin University of China in Beijing in July of 1998. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Chen. Sure. The page two. Uh, if I want to turn page, which one should I click? We'll click this one up and down. Okay. Yeah, page down. And okay, page, page down and page up. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Giovanna, for the uh, Giovanna for the uh, invitation, and really, it's my honor to speak at the uh, uh, Harrison uh, Public Library. Uh, I really enjoy all the opportunity to you know to give back to the community, and I live nearby here. I always love to come to the libraries to uh, speak. So, um, as as you all know, that today's topic is cryptocurrency one hundred and one. Uh, so cryptocurrency has been a very, very hot topic, I would say. So, um, so this is actually based on part of my, um, uh, the class I teach at New York University, FinTech class. Uh, one chapter there I teach was about uh, the uh, cryptocurrency. So it's a, um, I would say the condensed version of the longer uh, session at the university. I will try to cover some of the uh, basics and also try to um, you know, uh, illustrate it with some of the examples. Hopefully it will be interesting. Uh, my hope is after this, uh, uh, let's say a short seminar, you guys will know a bit better uh, about what is cryptocurrency and uh, have a more, uh, I guess, meaningful conversation later on uh, because it's really developing very rapidly. So myself, uh, um, I would say let's start with the, uh, let me see, just admit. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, the, um, I would start with really, you know, the ABC of our future. Uh, cryptocurrency, it, it is really here to go. Um, uh, of course, you know, it, it is a topic, I would say it's very controversial. Uh, you got a lot of people who are really against it. A lot of people are totally for it. Uh, it's almost like, um, you know, it's become like a belief. But in the end, I think um, I like to show some of the uh, concrete uh, examples of the framework of why it is so interesting and why it's going to be here to stay. So the ABC of our future, uh, algorithm, that's A, algorithm. Um, I would say our future, uh, you know, the whole pandemic thing for the past two years kind of accelerated this trend. But I think really, you know, going forward, it's more and more, I think our life, our work, uh, everything is going to be driven by algorithm. It's a scary thing, but it's happening. Everything is data driven. Uh, so someone's people are smiling, but it's true. <laughs> everything is data driven. And um, the, uh, the human society, I would say for the past 6,000 years moved from originally, I would say really it was a land based feudal society that's basically uh, on agriculture uh, based. You know, if you own land, 
you own the society. You all, uh, you know, you're you're the you're in the top, and then it moved from a feudal society, land based to a capital based society, which is really industrial production based. The more you produce on industrial scale, uh, the better, the, um, uh, the the richer you are, the more powerful you are. And now it's moving toward a data-based uh, society, digital society. This really, I would say, it's it's a big trend. That's a algorithm. What is data? Data is algorithm. It's about uh, you know what people know about you, what the data you have. Uh, I've seen some studies showing that every minute uh, we uh, walk around, we emit more than uh, like megabytes data. Basically, our location, our habit. Uh, uh, you know, our, our data are being constantly emitted out to society and being received by an old kind of, um, it's not really only about even social network, uh, all kinds of um, places are receiving our data. So that's algorithm. B, what's A, B, C, B, B of our future, blockchain. Blockchain, what is blockchain? Blockchain is really, it's a, it's a data record. And um, it's, it's data record, but it's a crypto based. Essentially, it's um, what's called, it's immutable and complete transparent. These two are very, very powerful. What does this mean? It means if the data is on a blockchain, you cannot go back to change it. There's no way to change it. If something is on blockchain, it's, it's on forever. Uh, second, it's completely transparent. In the sense, that's why when people talk about, you know, uh, Bitcoin, they think, you know, it could be used for, for money laundry, for a lot of illicit activities. Uh, maybe, however, you know, on, on, on blockchain, uh, all the Bitcoin transaction, also it's completely transparent. So if, if, if you did do something bad, it's, it's actually transparent. People can trace it, everything back. So that's a blockchain based uh, uh, future. What's C, ABC of our future? C, cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is basically, it's a currency based on blockchain technology. And uh, it's, it's, it's likely to be a cornerstone of every financial transaction going forward. And um, it is decentralized autonomous organization, DAO, which means we're going to be, it's likely, it's almost for sure that uh, the future is decentralized. Everything's going to be decentralized. Um, you know, recently I was at a seminar, they talked about even, you know, the wars now right now are being run in a decentralized way. If you try to run a war with a centralized fashion, you will lose because, you know, decentralized way, autonomous, smaller organization is going to be the main approach for everything we do. So this is a ABC of our future. So let's go step back a little bit. Uh, what does traditional finance do? Uh, traditional finance, uh, it does, um, you know, you go, you open a check, checking account, you go to a bank, you have savings account, you borrow, you have for mortgage loans, uh, credit card loans, insurance, annuity, everything, tax planning and all those. And I would say each and every of those activities done by traditional finance could be done by uh, crypto. Why? Because crypto, it will be, um, it's decentralized finance. In a sense that on the crypto uh, space, for whatever you do, you do not need to all, uh, go to a centralized authority, centralized entity to, to approve your activity. It's consent-based, it's crypto-based, and it's uh, blockchain-based. That as long as you prove what you are doing, you don't need anyone else. The credibility, there's no trust issue. The credibility is by uh, crypto technology instead of by, you know, your historical trust, your relationship with a banker, et cetera. And it's mobile based. All the cryptos are now mobile based and zero to little fees and entry barriers have been lowered. And one last point is I, my personal um, view is that the, the regulators, um, just to shape a little bit. The, the regulators are opening up the field too. The regulators are actually um, much more open towards the, um, you know, the crypto uh, future. Uh, I would say uh, last, um, yeah, someone tried to go in. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. What's that? Okay. Ah, uh, okay.
Okay, it's good. Yeah. So the regulators are much more open to that. Even even you know the latest news is even the um, um, fidelity is starting to offer um, uh, Bitcoin in the retirement account. Uh, so all these are happening. So, but let's go back a little bit. Uh, okay. The, <laughs> yeah. At, at the very beginning, right? Uh, how do people, how did people pay each other? It was direct the payment barter system, right? I produce some apple, you produce some chicken, we exchange the produce, and that's how the direct payment started. And later on, uh, banks stepped in. So banks, what, what do the banks do? The, their function is really a centralized clearing function in the sense that you pay something to the bank and bank would pay this to the, your counterparty, your friend, let's say if he sold some uh, apple to you, you don't pay him directly, but you pay it through a bank. So that's how the, how the payment is done right now. Globally, it's a centralized system. But the question is, is the bank always needed? Uh, the answer right now is not necessary because what we are experiencing, what you, we are seeing right now is you go from original direct payment. So you exchange produce of each other, let's say agricultural products to the centralized payment system. So you, don't, you do it through, uh, let's say a, a commercial bank or credit card company or you know, let's say West Union and all those. And then after that, what we are experiencing right now, the crypto space is actually decentralized payment again, in the sense that right now, if you use crypto to pay someone, let's say if you want to pay someone with um, uh, Bitcoin, uh, I've, I've, I've heard you know, some of the news about people are buying a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a lot of people in Singapore, when they are buying Lamb Lamborghini, those really, really expensive cars, they are paying by uh, Bitcoin because they want to cut down the transaction cost, which means they pay with uh, um, Bitcoin, which does not go through any, any centralized clearing system, which means we are going back to the direct payment. So human society is really you know, moving forward, progressing forward, but with uh, going back to the more traditional payment approach, which is the, decentralized pro you don't need a bank anymore it is a very scary system right so but you know back to the question though know, even you know the the barter system right you pay each other directly it still it still survives after thousands of years uh you know if if you check on their craigslist right uh, people you know pay each other service if i you know do the eye exam for you if you can do some home renovation for me things like that and also, usually those barter systems, they, uh, you know, people use barter more during economic downturn or a recession. Uh, why? Uh, because, you know, those more robust systems, they would pop up more frequently when there's a, a stress. And the recession, economic downturn, it is what um, would pop up. Another example, in fact, think about it. When was Bitcoin invented? It was invented in late 2008 during the last big global financial crisis when people were worried about the banks might not survive. When the, you know, uh, if you read the, uh, the book from Federal Reserve uh, chairman, they talk about a panic in the market. People are worried that their money will be gone in the bank. So at that time, essentially, that's how a uh, bunch of smart people got together and decided to invent uh, Bitcoin, which means they don't need to rely on any other entity, commercial bank or uh, central bank. They can just rely on the algorithm to do it. And then, of course, you know, how currencies was, uh, currency was invented, right? It was really, you know, uh, created to facilitate the payment. That's why for a lot of countries, uh, currencies were gold, silver, copper. And those other form of uh, currencies, for example, this is a picture of uh, uh, a Pacific island. On the Pacific island, uh, the native people there, they did not have gold or silver, but they still need to pay each other, right? How did they do it? They, ca they carve out a big stone and then put name on it. And if I want to pay you something, I write someone else's name on it. So from today on, you're going to receive, you can own this big stone as your wealth. And people exchange fishery, ex exchange uh, all kinds of things, but 
And after that, with the fiat currency, government came in, created currency. So the need is always there for currency, but it's more about what the form of a currency society, uh, you know, let's as a whole choose to use, whether it's about precious metal, whether it's about, let's say, stones on islands, or whether it's about fiat currency regulated by the government. So, so think about, you know, uh, let's say some of the oldest currency that show, you know, let's say a show is not necessarily currency. If you look at the Asian culture, however, you need to drill a hole on the shell to prove you did some work on it. And with that, that's counted as currency, which means, which means it's always about, you know, you need to prove you did some work, right? So now let's go to the this first successful cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, right? So what is actually really Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is something essentially, it's a record of blockchain that has been proven, um, there's a work um, proved on it. In the sense that Bitcoin is a, is a formula, it's a calculation. You need to run a computer to, did, to do the calculation. The more calculations you do, put it back on the blockchain, the more work that you can prove you have done it and your reward is you receive Bitcoin for your work. That's why the whole Bitcoin is not really empty. It's not what they say that it's virtual, it's, there's nothing behind, no. There's something behind which is the work has been done. The more work you do, the more Bitcoin you receive. Just like you know, when people mine the uh, mine gold, uh, mine silver, mine, uh, um, um, uh, and when when the Pacific Island people when they get shells, they drill a hole on the shell to prove they did some work. So Bitcoin is basically you need the the computer, you need to the algorithm to do the calculation for the other users. The more cal calculation you do, you put it back on the on the chain the more reward you get, which is you're incentivized, uh, you're incentivized to do more, which means you got paid for it. That's why um, Bitcoin, it is a real currency. It is cryptocurrency, it is it's a digital currency, but still it is currency. It is, that's why I believe it is here, it is here to stay. And of course, you know, the whole um, network is decentralized network that there's no there's no trust issue. You don't need to know the other party you're paying to whether they will whether he will be you know grab your money and, and gun because your payment to each other is on the blockchain. You cannot you cannot regret you cannot uh, you know go to renegotiate. So it's trustless, permissionless. You don't need anyone's permission to spend your money. In, in some way, you know, right now, think about uh, what's going on in, uh, uh, you know, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it's terrible, and all the Russian assets got uh, frozen overseas. Um, however, you know, uh, suppose the Russian central bank owns Bitcoin, right? You cannot, you cannot freeze their bit uh, Bitcoin holding. Um, so, and, and also it's censorship less too, so in the sense that no one can deny your access to your Bitcoin if you own the uh, Bitcoins. So that's the, uh, that's the first success story of uh, cryptocurrency as today, you know, we're talking about the 101 of uh, cryptocurrency. So that's how Bitcoin, what's the history, right? The, the whole, the, the Bitcoin actually started with a, a white paper uh, published in uh, October, 2008. That was in the middle of the big, big financial crisis. If you remember, that was the time the Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, went bankruptcy, and uh, many other banks were acquired, uh, and uh, it was a big uh, panic in this country and globally, and uh, and then people were looking for a solution. One solution they looked for was basically, you know, we don't want to rely on anyone else. We want to be able to prove we're doing the work and we'll get paid for it. And so uh, January 2009, um, uh, Bitcoin network was launched and the first uh, 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 Genesis block was mined. And uh, in May 2010, uh, uh, last real, uh, uh, this person actually used 10,000 Bitcoin to buy two pizza, which is worth in probably $50 million now to buy two pizza. And, um, and uh, what is the uh, adoption rate, right? Why Bitcoin has become mean so, 
has 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 been so popular. I would say it's really because the transaction volume uh, went up a lot. It's getting more and more accepted. Why? Because like any currency, right? You need people to accept it. You need, you know, if a country issues currency, if a country issues a currency in a very reasonable way, uh, more and more people will use it. Just like, for example, dollar, US dollar is accepted globally. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, it's, 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 that's why it's well accepted. It's a, it's a world reserve currency. And Bitcoin is moving towards this direction too. It's being accepted. Uh, a lot more now. Here it is a um, you know a chart of the number of unique addresses used for Bitcoin. You can see that at the very beginning, uh, uh, January two thousand nine, there was one user of Bitcoin. So the first guy, uh, um, um, Satoshi, mined the first Bitcoin, and then it kind of um, uh, you know initially a couple of years was slow, and then you you will see the explosive growth later on. So right now, you know, actually people are using Bitcoin to um, to buy house, buy car. I've heard people uh, uh, um, uh, in Manhattan, they use it to pay for private school tuition. Uh, so it has been accepted a lot more now, but I, I, I still believe it's really just the beginning because the whole cryptocurrency is going to be a lot more than just Bitcoin itself. Is uh, some of the uh, you see the transaction volume went up, you know, uh, probably hundred percent, uh, hundred thousand percent. Uh, the market value, uh, you, you can see that Bitcoin, you know, it is um, it is slowly, but it 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 is it does actually take uh, you know um, it, it did take over a lot of market cap from gold. Uh, think about this right now. You hear a lot less people talk about buying gold. And a lot more those people who used to buy gold, hard gold to um, protect their wealth, their wealth. Now they're buying Bitcoin and save at, um, um, and you can see the market capitalization, total market capitalization of, of Bitcoin. It went, of course, initially zero to, you know, um, uh, 2018, there was a peak of a uh, 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 hundred billion. And then, uh, and then again, went up a lot more. So um, it is being accepted much widely now. And let's talk about you know, uh, the ecosystem. So cryptocurrency, it's not just about one currency or one um, you know, um, entity in it. It's a very, very big system. Uh, there's, of course, there's the uh, developer, the, the, the Bitcoin foundation, and also the miners, the mining pools. <coughs> The um, Bitcoin, um, it is, you know, people use the word mining, uh, which is very, very good term because this mining actually reflects, you know, just like when people are mining gold, uh, you, you, you know, here, essentially, instead of, uh, you know, going to the, uh, um, to the mountains to dig the gold or uh, uh, copper out, right now, what you're using, you use the uh, computers to do the calculation. And uh, in the sense that the more calculation you do, the more Bitcoin you can mine out. So there's a second group in this ecosystem. Investors, another group, uh, could be anyone, right? Could be uh, students, could be you know, professional investors, but uh, investors globally, uh, a lot of investing in Bitcoin, they save their wealth in it. And, uh, and I would say also, you know, quite often you see Bitcoins quite often right now are used a lot more in countries um, that are not very stable because they're afraid of government, government will take their wealth. That's why you see Bitcoins are very widely used in, for example, Venezuela, very widely used in Brazil, uh, very widely used in Turkey and uh, in China, in India, in Kazakhstan, uh, in Russia also. And uh, I would say the uh, citizens of those countries, they are much more, uh, much earlier uh, adopter of, of uh, Bitcoin, for example, uh, versus countries, uh, versus uh, people, let's say in this country, another group. And then exchanges, uh, of course, you know, there are hundreds of exchanges because Bitcoin is really, I would say, lightly re regulated. It's not like no one regulates them. Of course, it's regulated, but uh, uh, it's lightly regulated. It's not like New York Stock Exchange, of course. 
the, you know, there are hundreds of, hundreds of Bitcoin uh, or let's say crypto exchanges. Many of them, they don't have even a fixed address. It's basically you set up a, uh, let's say a server, you, 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 and you open an exchange and let people trade on your exchange, right? Uh, obviously there are a lot of, um, I would say irregularities, fraudulent activities, but that's like anything in the early stage. Uh, you got a lot of, I would say, the, um, you know, at the, uh, the, um, uh, at the very beginning, there's always extreme, I would say, uh, variation of different ways people are doing uh, this. And you can see it from exchanges too. There are some exchanges that are highly regulated uh, in the US, some completely do not have any regulation. And then another group, which is called regulators, hackers, and dark webs. These are the uh, people who are really, you know, uh, uh, try to make it more, um, I would say, following the rule versus the other group, try to steal stuff. And uh, every day you hear, uh, you know, some uh, Bitcoin exchanges, some wallets got hacked, but also every day you see more uh, government regulations are coming to this, uh, you know, into this uh, space. Uh, you see the Congress, had a, had many hearings about uh, the uh, regulation of uh, uh, Bitcoin. You see the Federal Reserve talk about uh, uh, issuing uh, digital currency as well. And right now, um, I would say um, there are you know at least five to actually probably more like eight thousand different uh, cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin is the first one, but there are like thousands of others. And last part is ICO and altcoins. This is basically for those people who are issuing different uh, coins uh, you can issue all kinds of whatever coin you can you can imagine there are as i said you know right now more than probably uh, seven eight thousand different uh, coins available and uh, in the ecosystem you have those uh, you have those uh, developers right those core developers they wrote original code uh, for the uh, for the system and then you got those uh, so-called mining pools. Uh, so, so the the mining pools are um, are really distributed globally. It is very interesting that the original uh, Bitcoin, uh, I would say, the uh, mining power, the computation power, was predominantly in Asia. It was in China, in Japan, in Hong Kong a lot. And uh, but interestingly, for the last two three years there have been a migration, a great migration toward the US uh, and a major reduction of uh, Bitcoin mining, um, uh, uh, you know, hash rate in, in Asia, in particular in China. Uh, you can attribute this to, you know, very harsh uh, uh, regulatory crackdown in China against Bitcoin and, uh, and many other reasons, uh, including, you know, the, right now, I think the, uh, the, the electricity uh, rate in the US, it is cheaper, in fact. So you got uh, economic um, incentive for a lot of Bitcoin miners uh, to move to the US. Uh, and quite often they, lo they locate their, um, you know, uh, servers nearby, uh, let's say a wind uh, turbine or uh, um, uh, wind power base or, or the uh, hydro uh, power uh, gen generator in this country. And uh, that, that at least they can, they can count it as uh, renewable energy instead of using the traditional energy, which would uh, be polluting the environment. So the Bitcoin, the miners, they are getting a lot more, um, I would say, distributed, uh, originally from China, not, but now a lot more global. And the exchanges, interestingly, um, you got actually some of the um, largest ex uh, the exchanges uh, for Bitcoin or for crypto in general, they are... Um, they are based on those offshore islands that uh, there's actually not even a real uh, physical address. Uh, however, many of those bitcoins that are um, uh, exchanges are regulated in the uh, in the U.S. capital markets. They are uh, developing very quickly too. Uh, even the uh, CME, the you know the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the largest exchange, uh, derivative exchange in the world. Now they have introduced uh, Bitcoin futures. And uh, of course, Barcard. Barcard is actually affiliated with uh, New York Stock Exchange. So all those, I would say the traditional stock exchanges or futures exchanges 
are in the um, uh, Bitcoin or I would say in the crypto uh, space as well. And I think this is a future that uh, more regulation, more accept, more acceptance uh, in the uh, in the exchange. Uh, where in in New York, you can see actually, for example, like uh, uh, you know, some of the exchanges. Uh, actually, many of them are based in New York City. And uh, you know, the um, the the uh, the legal status for for Bitcoin, or I would say for the cryptocurrency in general, is is it varies a lot uh, in, for different countries. Uh, you got some of the countries that uh, what's called the, the red ones. They're completely banning it, so you cannot do anything. Bitcoin is completely illegal, and you got countries, uh, you know, green are really countries that actually allow Bitcoin. It's legal to use cryptocurrency. You can you can use cryptocurrency in, in this country, let's say, if you want to buy a house, and uh, and then you got those countries are kind of uh, you know contentious, you know, not very sure, and uh, including uh, you know uh, I would say uh, uh, Russia, you know, India, etc. And the gray area are the countries have no opinion on this. Uh, really, you know, there's no uh, decision about it. And what about the, the, the ICOs and outcomes? Uh, interestingly, traditional uh, IPOs, you know, let's say company, you know, you start a company after you run it three years, five years, 10 years, or maybe longer, you become the company is more mature, you file for um, IPO with an exchange and and, uh, and then you become a public traded company. And ICO uh, is very different in the sense that you have, essentially you, uh, you write a white paper. The white paper would explain what you want to do with, uh, with your coin. Let's say um, Harrison Library coin, we can call that. And with that, you know, with a white paper, you go for ICO, you can raise money, you can raise a lot of money, you can raise less. And after that, your coin will be public traded because there's not really any regulation with uh, a coin ICOs. That's why there are thousands, thousands of ICOs. Anyone who uh, is interested in, in doing it just can reference, write a white paper and after that raise the coin. Obviously, most of those coins are not very useful. You don't have a lot of acceptance and most of the coins likely are going to go to zero. But uh, some of them are, are becoming much more um, established, accepted. And uh, you can you can think about you know even Elon Musk right he has been promoting uh, Dogecoin right this coin originally was supposed to be a joke supposed to be really you know people make fun of it but now because Elon Musk talked about it all the time this coin coin is is getting a lot more accepted globally and. Um, and you know, to think about the cost, right? When people uh, uh, you know try to uh, do an ICO, you know, the, the cost of uh, you know, writing a white paper, published online, and get the servers up and running, you know, cost probably fifty to five hundred k. And then after you can you can fund it. And the the lowest one we heard is a guy who actually spent fifty nine dollar uh, in total to to do his um, uh, ICO and raised two hundred thousand dollars. So uh, for his coin. And uh, obviously, you know, one important idea, uh, you know, is really, you know, about uh, the, what, are the, what is the next generation? Because Bitcoin itself, it is the first um, cryptocurrency. It's widely accepted, but it's also based on very uh, simple original um, white paper that you cannot change this anymore. So what's next, right? And Ethereum is really the, I would say the second generation uh, coin in the sense that you use it not only for uh, transaction to pay each other, but also you can use it for uh, smart contracts. So essentially people can write con contracts build a new ecosystem based on Ethereum. That's why uh, the, this uh, decentralized uh, uh, virtual um, system, it is really you know, very, very powerful. And that's why Ethereum is really right next to uh, Bitcoin become very, very popular in the sense that you can, you know, you can build smart contracts on this uh, instead of just paying each other. And there, are, of course, there are many other coins. You know, um, Litecoin uh, was founded in 2011 from a, a person from MIT, and uh, you know what 
of course, everyone tried to improve. Just like internet was originally invented, right? And when search engine was originally uh, invented, you, uh, there were a lot of search engine before before Google was uh, was founded. And so uh, when Bitcoin is invented, you know, people try to Bitcoin. There are some, I would say, uh, shortcomings, including Bitcoin is uh, relatively slow to transact. The, uh, the cost, transaction cost is a little higher. So people invented something, for example, uh, Litecoin. Which is four times faster uh, than Bitcoin, so essentially it facilitates transaction, <coughs> and also uh, Ripple. I found it sound four. Uh, Ripple is actually essentially mined by the company, and it's actually getting a lot more connect um, connected, accepted by the uh, by the commercial banks, and also the Dogecoin, interesting one, uh, founded by Jackson Palmer. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, it was initially started as a joke, but then because it was very, very cheap, it was really, you know, people use this to tip each other on, on blog, etc. It got a very, very strong community and with the endorsement of uh, Elon Musk, which, uh, you know, is uh, probably the, uh, the most, one of the most influential men right now in this world. And when, he, when Elon Musk talked about um, Dogecoin all the time, many times, it really imp uh, improved the acceptance uh, of the coin. And that's why in Bitcoin, uh, in crypto space, you actually really need influencers because influencers help bring uh, uh, credibility and bring volume to, uh, to, the, to the ecosystem. And there are a lot more uh, different, uh, you know, Monero, uh, Dashcoin, Zcash, etc. And I would say it's really, you know, they're all trying to um, improve uh, in the sense that, you know, Bitcoin itself is a pseudo uh, anonymous in the sense that the wallet is visible to public. People can see everything is done on Bitcoin. Whatever you don't want people to see everything what you're doing. So uh, that's why, you know, those um, uh, privacy coins were invented. And um, uh, many of them are a lot more successful now than a couple of years ago because Bitcoin itself is becoming, I would say, it becoming the, the gold of the um, crypto space. But on the, on the other hand, it become much more uh, slower to innovate. And you can see many other, uh, you know, stable coins, etc., in this world. And you can also de uh, decentralize it, and uh, the volume are going up. And interestingly, the, the decentralized system, a lot of those people actually live in New York. So I would say Brooklyn probably is the worldwide capital now in the DAO, decentralized autonomous organizations. And What's next, right? Uh, we don't have a lot of time today. As I mentioned earlier, this is you know one of the uh, sessions I teach at uh, the uh, New York University fintech class. It you, you know it's like it's a whole semester <laughs> class teaching. But um, I would say I want to talk about the future. Right? What are the future? Future I think it will be really more DeFi, decentralized finance. So essentially, uh, there will be a lot more apps being developed. Just like think about very beginning when iPhone was invented, right? How many apps are there? Were probably ten apps, and it was all owned by Apple, and no one can do anything. But initially, people were very happy already with iPhone, right? However, how many apps were were later on developed? How many apps? Probably app. Apple doesn't develop any more new apps anymore, my guess. There are probably 10,000 new apps being developed and uh, they're all used for specific functions and people even want more and more. And I would say in the uh, crypto space, the same uh, dynamics, because you already got a bit Bitcoin is going to be uh, there, but uh, you know people are going to invent a lot more uh, apps uh, based on the current uh, system to improve it. And, uh, and a lot more money have been locked into uh, DeFi too, in the sense that they want to create a parallel universe versus the traditional finance. I wouldn't be surprised at some point people are going to be able to borrow, let's say, mortgage uh, from, let's say, DeFi space instead of go to a bank to borrow mortgage. And uh, there are some, a lot of projects going on. 
and I'll have a quick uh, talk about the, the, you know, what's the technical structure of Bitcoin. It, it's really Bitcoin is, is built, built, it's built on a blockchain, right? Like any other cryptocurrency. And what is uh, uh, the, the system is basically, you know, you got every, every second, every millisecond, there's a block being built. Uh, who did what, you know, uh, what are the transaction, et cetera. And you got globally, you got millions of people doing the calculation for you, add to the chain from the very beginning till now, every transaction is recorded. And then the proof uh, the proof of work, just like think about you go to dig a uh, gold mine, you need to spend a lot of energy, dig the gold out, refine it. And then the, after that you own the gold. And in Bitcoin, the same, you need to, you need to not uh, you know, physically work on, but use a computer to do the calculation. And the more calculation you do, the more proof of work you do, and the more Bitcoin you will receive automatically. And that's really the, how the community the structure is being built. Some of the right now, some of the, the Bitcoin network, you can see that uh, it's very, very, very uh, well um, versus let's say in the US. You got, uh, you know, there are uh, 9,000 nodes. You got a lot of them East Coast, West Coast, and a lot of them in Europe, a lot of them in East Asia, and I would say in uh, Southeast Asia. And that's really the, you know, the Z uh, network right now. The top countries with Bitcoin nod nodes right now for connecting each other, uh, US, Germany, France, Netherlands, Singapore, Canada, UK, China, Russia, and Japan. So 10 top countries in Bitcoin. And, you know, and also I like to add also, you know, Bitcoin is not something completely new. It's like, think about, you know, uh, right now the, the, you know, COVID vaccine, right? Uh, people think about it, it's completely new, but it's not true, uh, true because it was built on 30 years of research uh, to develop the vaccine until finally they, they, they develop into uh, treatment for COVID. Uh, Bitcoin is the same. The blockchain technology was based on the, uh, you know, the original ancestor of this has been going on for more than uh, 20 years. Uh, people try to, uh, it was built on GitHub. It was another, uh, you know, online di distributed system. And also, you know, BitTorrent was another ancestor of Bit, uh, block blockchain over the last uh, uh, 20 years before, actually more, more than 30 years now. And, um, and we can, uh, I'll, I'll speak very briefly uh, about the, you know, investment strategies, right? If you want to involve yourself in Bitcoin, what do you want to do? Uh, there are many ways, right? You can buy and hold. Uh, if you bought Bitcoin, let's say 15 years ago, uh, you, you will be very, very rich now. <laughs> At that time, it was probably less than a cent per coin. Right now, it's what, $50,000 uh, per, per coin? Think about the guy who spent 10,000 Bitcoin to buy two pizza. Now it's worth probably eight, $80 million. But, you know, buy and hold is a way to do it, but also it could be very volatile, right? Bitcoin stock, uh, Bitcoin, the price every day goes up 10, goes up 10% uh, or 50%, et cetera. But also you can do arbitrage. You can go to one exchange because Bitcoin is not regulated heavily. You can go to one exchange, buy some and go to an, ex an exchange to sell it. You can arbitrage globally. There are hundreds of exchanges you can do it. You can do market making in a sense. You can, you can, if you see it's the price is too high, you can sell some today. Tomorrow you can buy some back and uh, you can use all kinds of, uh, you know, um, ways uh, to do it instead of, just, instead of just buy and hold, right? Buy and hold and, you know, think about buy and hold, you buy the Bitcoin, but if you bought it in December 2013, by January uh, 2015, so a year later, you would have lost 85%. So, and, you know, um, so this year, I think Bitcoin is probably down also 30, 40 percent. So the, 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 the loss is really, really massive. And of course, you can arbitrage, you can do market timing, all those. And but you, know, you, you can use quant system. And uh, of course, you know, Facebook is trying to do its own coin, too. Right. And um, and I want to say also something about, you know, the, the global perspective, because um, a Bitcoin in, you know, in this country, people, do, the, the finance, you know, is, is very deep in the sense that you can pay each other, you know, with check, with zero, with you know, a lot of different ways. 
but globally, let's say, if you want to pay someone in Philippines, you know, it's very, very expensive, right? There's uh, roughly, I would say five, seven percent cost, in fact. So with, with, you know, all the cryptocurrency, you can cut down the law, uh, the, the cost substantially, close to zero. And that's why Bitcoin, I would say, it's going to be even more useful for the global, uh, you know, uh, let's say international payment, basically, instead of thinking about currency loss, right? The exchange, when you exchange dollar to yen, yen to euro, uh, euro to peso, you lose a lot of money in the process. But in Bitcoin itself, you can carry it globally, travel to any country. You don't need to worry about cost, uh, commissions and all those. And uh, and also Bitcoin is very is very much mobile, right? It's all online based. You can use it for for you know for the insurance for a lot of other things. And some of the other uh, great ideas in Bitcoin uh, companies being done, but uh, we don't have a lot of time. And um, you know some of the future, what would be you know uh, payment? Um, I would say um, uh, you know uh, right now when People pay each other. Sometimes it's not the same day, right? You need to wait for next day to access your money. And going forward, I think with Bitcoin and also cryptocurrency, it's going to be real-time payment. I pay you next second. You should be able to use the money. Very cost-effective, mobile-based, easier, and call and so-called nano payment. In the sense, you can you, you don't have to pay people. Let's say let's say um, hypothetically, you have to pay people right now with dollar base. You can pay people at minimum. <coughs> is one cent right you if you if i want to pay you less than a cent not possible but in future i think payment could be done like i, I could pay you 0.003 cent and you can accept it still and you can accept millions of people pay you 0.005 cent the so-called nano payment is coming to and of course it sounds a little uh, ridiculous but it is you know why you, i have to pay you at least one cent right so <laughs> And uh, think about, you know, uh, a lot of the fintech companies are coming up. And, uh, and I want to, uh, before I answer answer some questions, I want to show some of the reading materials in case you want. Crypto Assets, that's a very good book. I saw it in many libraries, they have it. Uh, covers, you know, some of the basic ideas of different cryptocurrencies. And uh, Algorithm, Blockchain, Cryptocurrency, that's another very interesting book, very short book. Uh, by Gavin Brown. I like it. It's a very easy reading book. And this is another book, Fintech in a Flash, uh, 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 by Rubini. Uh, interesting book to read if you want to know more about Fintech itself. And uh, shamelessly, uh, shamelessly, I would I'd like to promote one book I contributed a chapter, the uh, you know uh, banking and financial issues in emerging markets. I wrote one chapter about fintech and uh, all the crypto payment for emerging markets to use, because a lot of countries they don't have banking service. Think about in Kenya, in a lot of countries, most of people in globally they don't have bank accounts. How do they get financial um, access, right? So crypto it is a way for them, and. Um, you know more more reading materials and uh, uh, happy to stay in touch. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn. Very easy to find me. And now I'm happy to answer some questions uh, for any of you. Please, uh, if you want, you can write your uh, question in the chat room, and I'm going to look at. There are four questions already, so I will start from the first one. Our bank. The first question is: Are banks resisting this system um i would say yes and no in the sense that um uh i think banks many banks are resisting the system especially the larger commercial banks however they see the trend it's like you know let's say if you were uh, renting you know movies uh, in cassettes you are really against any streaming service right but on the other hand, you will not, you will lose if you keep on resisting it because it's coming. And that's why I think many more banks are accepting it. Today I read on Wall Street Journal, there was an article talking about uh, almost all the major financial institutions are embracing uh, digital currency. They are, they are actually adding more infrastructure now. So the uh, banks, they are, um, they were resisting it, but I think they are adding, they, they, are, they are becoming more acceptable. 
And on the other hand, you know, in this country, uh, the central bank is Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve system has been really looking in, into it. And my personal view is that the Federal Reserve will issue uh, a digital currency in the US to a digital version of dollar. The reason they have not done it, one important reason I heard from uh, you know, Federal Reserve uh, President uh, of uh, San Francisco Fed, she said, um, uh, Mary Daly, she said, the reason is in this country, even in this country, in America, still a lot of people don't have a, a smartphone. She said, you look, you walk around the street, how many people do not have a smartphone? If you, uh, you know, make a, uh, let's say, digital dollar, if you have, let's say, 10% or 20% of the population do not have access to it, that's not fair to them. So th that's why, you know, the Fed is thinking about uh, eventually, the, you know, I heard one idea is the Fed wants to create a digital dollar account for every resident in this country and then put something like $80 into the worth of digital dollar to the account for everyone. And then after that, you can use it, you can do whatever you want, but uh, it's a way to promote a digital currency. And it's coming, I think, just a matter of time. On the other hand, also there's a pressure because other countries are doing it. European Union are doing a digital euro. Uh, China is doing digital RMB, has been uh, uh, you know, in testing. And the US would never stay behind if, you, know, if the, you see other countries are doing it. So I think it's coming in the US too. So next, let me see the, try is to see. To oh yeah, sure, yes. Okay, we have another question. Is the value of cryptocurrency measured in dollars? Do you have to exchange dollars to buy Bitcoin? Uh, it's not necessary. It's, it, it's the most popular way to look at it, but cryptocurrencies are measuring many other currencies too, everywhere. Yeah, you can even, uh, another way to look at it is a lot of uh, digital currencies are measured in Bitcoin. So you use Bitcoin itself to measure other digital currency. <laughs> It's another question, how secure are Bitcoin transactions? Um, Bitcoin transaction, it is very secure. Nothing beats it. There's no way to crack it because it's completely on the chain. However, Bitcoin itself, how secure it is depends on how you store it. Just like if you have a, a brick of gold, right? How you store it, it, it means it decides how secure it is. Um, if you start in a cold wallet, completely disconnect from internet, no one would be able to grab from you. But if you store it on your computer, if someone goes into a computer and they can grab it anytime, or in one second, probably. So, <laughs> yeah. What is the relationship between cryptocurrencies and NFTs? Is it the use of blockchains? Sure. sure. NFT is really, you know, you can think about it. NFT is a way that uh, they want to prove their ownership of something, not in a physical form, but in a, a digital format. Let's say if uh, instead of I own a Picasso painting, I would own something digitally, and that's NFT, non-fungible token, uh, token. but it, it is based uh, on, uh, I would say, same crypto technology. But NFT, you cannot pay each other. It's, you can think about NFT is really more like a luxurious item that, you know, in the past people own different fancy paintings, fancy clothes, fancy luxurious stuff, yachts, whatever. And now people own some NFTs as a way to, to prove they're wealthy. <laughs> yeah. Being that Bitcoin is roughly 38,000, um, which one is the next Bitcoin in your opinion? I would say Bitcoin itself will not be, uh, it will not be replaced. Bitcoin will be there. And uh, um, however, I would say the, uh, you know, Bitcoin would become something like value investment in crypto space. Essentially that, you know, when people want to store something valuable, they'll put it in Bitcoin. And I would say, you know, Ethereum probably would get more usage in the sense that you can think about it, it's more like uh, the copper, uh, in the real world that, you know, people use copper for wire, you know, for, for, uh, for, uh, for pipe, for a lot of use, industrial use, et cetera. So, so Ethereum probably is more uh, used for ap other applications. And then you got thousands of other coins depend on the uh, specific application to use. But Bitcoin itself, I think is very, very hard to replace it. Just like gold, you know, you could have platinum, you have, uh, you have other precious metals, 
but it's very, very difficult to replace it because right now the whole world, the whole society, not one society, but the many all different societies, you know, from Mexico to Asia to Europe, they are all pretty much accepting Bitcoin. So that's something you cannot replace anymore. Uh, does the rise of real-time payment systems across the globe undercut the need for systems like Bitcoin? Um, I would say it's uh, they are interlinked to each other because the global real-time payment systems, some of them, in fact, does use cryptocurrency as its uh, backbone of the infrastructure. So I would say they kind of help each other interlinked instead of just you know one versus other it's actually um it's it's mutually beneficial for a lot of real time payment system of course you could actually still do it traditional way in the sense that let's say hypothetically if i want if i want to pay someone in germany now uh, i need to change dollar to euro and then uh, at a bank and then send the euro to a german bank and the german bank will pay the person and right now, a lot of transactions have been done in the sense that I, I will transfer, uh, convert my dollar to crypto current to Bitcoin. And then I will send Bitcoin to the person in Germany and he will convert the Bitcoin to uh, Euro to be paid. And the whole process could be real time now. And it may or may not use cryptocurrency behind, but uh, it's highly likely that it's, you're, it's going to be using more crypto behind. It's about competition and, and it's about cost uh, benefit, uh, you know, benefit. Um, and then got one more here. Um, it seems to be in a miner's best interest to immediately broadcast blocks that they validate. Um, is there a trust issue with others? What would be the incentive to broadcast transactions right away? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very technical question. In fact, it depends on... Um, because right now, uh, there are a lot of uh, larger institutions they want to buy Bitcoin, actually. Um, however, you know, when they uh, get those coins, they want to get it from reputable uh, miner. So some of the miners, they might want to uh, immediately broadcast, sell it, uh, uh, cash in, etc. But some of them, they might be, let's say, mining using, you know, let's say, in, in a very uh, difficult location. Some of those, uh, the, the energy they use, let's say, hypothetical could be very, you know, from coal mine, uh, coal, <laughs> uh, coal burning uh, uh, power station, etc. So they might instead store it or transfer it first. So it's, it's hard to say, yeah. Okay, so I think we're almost exactly at eight o'clock. So we seem to time this perfectly. Um, does anyone else have any other questions they want to add to the chat or you can unmute yourself and see if there's any questions you'd like to ask? Okay. Okay, okay. Perfect. perfect. So we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks everyone, everyone for your time. time. And, and uh, again, again, I feel, feel very honored, honored to speak at the Harrison Public Library. Library. Hopefully, Hopefully see you guys again, again soon. Bye. All right. And thank you all for coming. I hope this, this was very interesting for me. I hope this was interesting for everyone else as well. Thank you for coming tonight. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>